Uh, welcome right. everyone. So this is our April session from the machine learning seminar. And I'm Katerina, organizer of, the, of this seminar. And next to me is Pat, my colleague. She will introduce our guest speaker, Jeff from Monash University. So please, Pat. <laughs> so this is, is Jeff Webb and he's from Monash University. <laughs> and I can read this, but I'm not going to. Uh, he's been doing machine learning a long time pretty much as long as me. I knew him first when I was at Boeing, which was a very long time ago before I came here. Um, but what he's gonna be talking about today is basically time series classification, which I don't know a lot about. So that will be interesting. So take it away. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, thank you very much. Oh. Screen sharing's been disabled, so it's going to be a very boring talking head only if somebody yeah. doesn't enable it. We'll try to do that, right? So I apologize. So no, no, no. Um, right click on it, like this. Yep. More. Yeah. Co-host. Yes. Okay. And now you should be able to do. Lovely. Awesome. Excellent. <laughs> It would be hard to talk just waving your hands. I would find that very difficult. Right. Can you see my screen? We yeah. can. Excellent. So it's supposed to be a video, but it's not videoing, but uh, we'll put up with that. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, talk to you this evening. Um, very great honor, and uh, I'm very excited by the research that uh, my group has been uh, doing and uh, delighted to have the opportunity to share it with you. Uh, and hopefully Pat will know a little bit more about time series uh, classification by the time I've finished. Uh, if not, I will have failed fairly badly. Ah, it's going to, ah, now it moves. So, the world is um, dynamic in a constant state of flux, but most machine learning systems treat it as if it were static. They take a snapshot of data at a particular point in time and learn a model from it uh, and then apply that model. One data type that captures dynamics uh, is time series. Uh, so you will all be familiar with uh, stock markets uh, time series, uh, but uh, they are increasingly ubiquitous. So sensors on everything from machines to wearable devices, uh, sound as a form of time series, uh, and the list goes on. The time series classification task is to uh, take a set of series for which you have labels, so they are in two or more categories, uh, and to work out how to take the raw series and from that um, determine what the label should be. My group's interest in the time series classification problem has been largely driven uh, by the use of um, Earth observation to monitor uh, environmental variables, um, such as land use. So being able to determine for each pixel um, in a um, satellite image, uh, what is being grown there, for example. Now, it turns out that you cannot readily distinguish, say, corn from soybean by what you observe in um, pixels uh, for each at any one point in time. Rather, you need to look at how they evolve over time. So what is displayed here is for each, right, so each of these lines represents the evolution of a single pixel in an image. Each of these lines are uh, corn pixels, each of these lines are soybean pixels, each of these are wheat pixels, and each of these are broadleaf tree pixels. So you can see that um, 
Corn shares an overall similar shape. Soybean shares an overall similar shape, uh, et cetera. Now, one of the fascinating things about uh, time series classification is that there are hugely differing aspects of a series that may potentially be relevant to classification. So to take a couple of um, examples from ECG, so monitoring a person's heart, if you want to uh, determine whether somebody's heart is racing or they have a normal pulse, then it's the frequency of the signal that is relevant. If you want to work out whether their heartbeat is irregular as opposed to regular, then it's the variance in the frequency that matters. If you want to work out whether their pulse is strong or weak, then it's the amplitude. And while I'm not an expert uh, in such things, it's quite credible that it may be possible to identify particular types of faults in the heart by the shape of, say, the peak of each um, beat in the heartbeat. Right? So local patterns may be important. And as we saw with the uh, satellite image analysis, uh, the global pattern may also be very important. Uh, I should beg forgiveness uh, for my dog who's... Um, in the background, uh, giving a bit of uh, commentary. I hope that's not too disturbing for you. Now, I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, talking about comparisons between multiple approaches to doing time series analysis. And to do that, I'm going to use critical difference diagrams. So I'm going to now give you an, a brief introduction to critical difference diagrams. Uh, either as a reminder or to uh, let you know what they are in case it's not front of mind. So often uh, in computer science, we have many different ways of doing something uh, which we can apply across many different tasks. And we want to have some easy way of getting an overview of the, relevant, the relative um, performance of those multiple approaches across multiple tasks. The critical difference diagrams were popularized by Demsa in 2006 in a very highly cited and much used uh, paper. And uh, he gives us an example, the task that I uh, hope you can see the table that my cursor is moving over where we have four variants of the famous machine learning algorithm C4.5. So C4.5, C4.5 plus M, C4.5 plus CF, and C4.5 plus M plus CF. And we have around a dozen tasks, which we're going to use to compare them. And what we're interested in, in is getting an idea of whether these variants of C4.5 lead to higher accuracy. So for each task, for each algorithm, we have an accuracy. What we do then is we rank those accuracies. So the highest accuracy on the adult task uh, is C4.5 plus M plus CF, so 0.798, higher than the others, so it gets rank one and so on down to C4.5, which has the lowest rank. The next one, C4.5 has the best rank and so forth. Then we can take the average of all those ranks. So we see C4.5 over this dozen or so tasks has an average rank of 3.1 something. C4.5 plus N has an average rank of two, uh, plus CF has 2.89, and plus M plus CF has 1.96. We then plot these on this critical difference diagram. The lines next to each algorithm uh, come to the rank. So we get a pictorial uh, depiction of where they lie on the possible uh, line of ranks. 
And then through a bit of statistical magic, um, Friedman rank test, uh, we compare uh, the performance and are able to work out what critical difference is statistically significantly different. And we can then draw a bar to group together those algorithms whose ranks are not statistically significantly different to one another. So what this graph is telling us is that over these tasks, comparing using accuracy as the measure, uh, uh, you cannot statistically significantly distinguish C4.5 from C4.5 plus CF, or the three variants of C4.5, but that these two variants of C4.5 are statistically significantly superior to C4.5. Well, sorry, that's a fairly laborious uh, explanation, uh, but I'm going to be using this a lot, so important that you understand it. Okay, so this now gives me the tool by which I can uh, uh, explain this next diagram. So because there are many things which may be relevant to time series classification, there's been much work on developing many different uh, class, uh, forms of classifier, each of which can pick up on these different things. There have been a large number of specialized time series classifiers and there's been um, uh, a benchmark repository of uh, classification tasks, so the University of California Riverside repository. And until recently, uh, there was no one time series classifier that dominated on that repository over all of the alternatives. And then there was a revolution. So the revolution uh, was the introduction of ensemble techniques. So uh, many of you will be familiar with the idea of ensemble techniques. Instead of using a single classifier, you take many classifiers, apply them all to your task, and then in some way uh, combine their multiple predictions to produce a single prediction. So one of the first of these was the elastic ensemble, uh, which combines many uh, nearest neighbor classifiers, where each of the nearest neighbor classifiers uses a different similarity measure, especially designed to pick up different aspects of similarity between different time series. And you can see here that the elastic ensemble is significantly more accurate than any of the uh, nearest neighbor classifiers that uh, it comprises. So it is an ensemble of all of these classifiers. And they didn't stop with just an ensemble of nearest neighbor classifiers. Uh, all of these uh, time series classifiers up the right hand side uh, are um, ensemble techniques. Um, so uh, shapelet transform uh, uses many, um, uh, many, many classifiers that pick up on um, localized shapes. So shapeless is a small shape, uh, as in my example of how maybe the, the shape of the top of a heartbeat may tell you something. Um, and uh, so forth. And uh, then the coat classifier started putting together these ensembles. So coat is an ensemble of, ensemb of ensembles. Uh, flat coat just took all the ensembles and uh, took a majority vote. Then hive coat took the ensembles and did a weighted um, average. So we can see ensembles and then ensembles of ensembles uh, really, to put not too fine a point on it, wiped the floor with everything which had been done previously if you are talking about a generic classifier. So they showed that it was possible to be much, much, much more accurate 
than the previous uh, specialised classifiers, but they simply didn't um, scale. So for one of our uh, satellite image um, classification tasks, uh, where we had a million examples, um, that's a very small uh, Earth observation uh, task to do the entire Earth's surface with the particular satellite that uh, this one is drawn from is 1.5 uh, trillion uh, examples. So many, many, many orders of magnitude greater than this. Um, but Hivecoat applied to uh, this problem uh, took eight days for one and a half thousand time series, and we estimated it would take over 200 years to learn from all one million examples. So clearly it wasn't going to be useful for our Earth observation task. So we set ourselves the task of trying to create um, much more scalable time series classifiers that we hoped would be almost as accurate as this um, incredibly accurate, uh, but not remotely scalable approach. Uh, and I've been extremely uh, pleased with uh, what we've achieved. I'm going to take you through uh, the three types of approach that we've pursued. So first of all, tree-based approaches. So decision trees are a classic approach to uh, scalable classification. Uh, then deep learning, because deep learning seems to be good at almost everything. So we thought that we should uh, see how it performs here. Uh, and then finally, uh, the rocket system, which I will explain when we get there. This is very recent work. Uh, I'm going to present uh, work from uh, four papers published in the Data Mining and Knowledge Discovery uh, Journal, uh, one in 2019 and three of them last year. Uh, and then uh, the most recent rocket work uh, has just been accepted for publication this year's KDD conference. So let's start with the tree-based classifiers. And this is uh, the PhD work of uh, Ben Lucas. So we started by thinking just about how we might take the elastic ensemble. So that's the ensemble of many, uh, uh, many nearest neighbor classifiers, each using different distance measures. How might we take that and create a scalable version of that? And we thought, well, one possible approach would be to use divide and conquer. So it's a standard computer science approach to scaling things up. So split the overall problem into sub problems until you get to something very simple and then pass the cumulative result back up. Um, and in our work, we've chosen wherever the design choices, if possible, use the same design choices was used in Elastic Ensemble. Uh, and the reason for doing this isn't because we think Elastic Ensemble had particularly good design choices, but more because we want to make uh, it clear that the um, differences between the performance of our approach and Elastic Ensemble is due to the fundamental difference in strategy rather than because we made a better choice about one of the parameters for one of the distance measures. Um, so the divide and conquer approach uh, used in machine learning is decision trees, but standard tree-based splits don't work for time series, right? So a standard way to do it would be to treat the time series as simply a set of attribute values and then choose one time point and split on the values at the, that time point. Um, but that that's, uh, has been tried, but it's not a very successful approach. So what we hit upon was instead to use proximity. So this uses the concept of uh, 
neighbourliness, um, which comes from the nearest neighbour classifier. So we have 11 different distance measures used in the elastic ensemble, and we're going to use those to uh, calculate how like an exemplar an object is. For each branch going from a node, we're going to choose an exemplar. So here we're looking at a binary split. And we then apply a distance measure to work out how each of the series at the node, how close it is to each of the exemplars and send it down the branch corresponding to that exemplar. So we can see here if we have two classes where one has a peak uh, and the other doesn't, um, this simple method can very readily split the R2 up. You can see that as projecting the time series onto a multi-dimensional space defined by distance or similarity to each of the exemplars. And then choosing a simple, simple hyperplane to separate them. So in detail, uh, replace use decision trees, but replacing conventional decision tree splits with similarity comparisons. Uh, we're not just going to use any old similarity comparison. We'll use the 11 um, specialized time series um, similarity measures, which have been developed over a long time of research into uh, time series analysis. Each branch is going to have an exemplar. We'll choose one exemplar per class, and so hence have one branch per class. So each branch has an exemplar. Each node or each split has both a measure, so one of the 11 measures, and a parameterization of that measure, because many of the uh, measures have parameters. Um, and then for classification, we simply pass the series down the branches exemplar if it's most similar uh, until we get to a leaf and the leaves then uh, have associated classes. Now, this leaves us the problem of how do we choose the exemplars? How do we choose the distance measures? And how do we choose the parameterizations of those distance measures? And our choice is to do all of that at random. Why do it at random? Well, first of all, it's fast. And one of the things we want to do is to be fast. Uh, another reason is because random choices have low bias. So just to remind you about bias and variance, if you're not uh, familiar with the concepts, uh, you can think of the bias and variance of a classifier as being similar to uh, what happens uh, with an archer when they're, when they're hitting a, uh, sh shooting at a target. Right? So an extremely precise um, archer will always be on target. Another type of archer might be um, might have a good central tendency, right? So they uh, are aiming towards the center of the target, but they're not all that accurate. So there's a, a considerable spread. Another possibility is that you're very consistent, but consistently off target. Another possibility is that you're both consistently off target and have considerable spread. So you can see that, uh, and, and um, if you move this to the classification um, task, so being on target uh, equates to selecting the correct task, uh, the being, uh, ha having spread relates to variance. So you're, you tend to be on target, but, uh, as you try time and again, sometimes you move away from the target. High bias is being consistently off target and high bias and variance is both being off target and having a spread. So you can see that to be accurate, you have to have both low bias and low variance. 
And what ensembling tends to, uh, and what random choices do is reduce the bias, but they tend to introduce high variance. So you tend to get something looking like this. And then ensembling tends to reduce the variance, taking us back to the low bias, low variance uh, position. And now the major training time, because all the choices we want to make are at random and so done very quickly, the major training time is simply passing the training examples down the tree. We found that it's possible to reduce the number of trees that are needed in order to get uh, reasonably good performance by instead of being totally at random, have at each node five totally random choices and then assess how well each of them does and choose the one which performs best. And we use the Gini criterion to assess the accuracy of the different alternatives. So this reduces the number of trees uh, and that leads to uh, faster training and also faster classification. Uh, and it uh, slightly improves um, classification performance. So if we now compare this proximity forest, as we call the resulting uh, stochastic ensemble algorithm. Our intention was to produce a fast variant of the elastic ensemble, but when we do a comparison across the UCR repository, uh, we can actually see that it is significant, it is more accurate than the elastic ensemble on significantly more tasks. Uh, so it is um, significantly more often more accurate. And indeed, uh, it's, statistically in, uh, um, it's statistically indistinguishable from the, the first version of code, although it doesn't uh, quite reach the level of the second version. So it's not only more, substantially more accurate than the elastic ensemble, it's also orders of magnitude um, faster. So the elastic ensemble uh, uh, takes days to um, process thousands of examples. We can process a million, the million examples from the satellite problem uh, in 17 hours. There are yet more scalable uh, time series classifiers, so BOSVS and WEASEL. Uh, however, um, the, scalable, the highly scalable one uh, does not achieve as high classification on our, our satellite classification task. So we can see that proximity forest is not only faster than most of them, uh, but also more accurate. Moving on to the next variant of the um, tree-based classifier. So this is the PhD work of Ahmed Shifaz. So proximity forest uh, is taking the elastic ensemble component of the highly accurate um, coat classifier, uh, but coat also includes uh, interval-based uh, and dictionary-based uh, components. Uh, so we uh, decided to try to introduce those into our tree classifier. So it's using three types of splitting function. Uh, it's still selecting candidate splits at random um, so it's selecting a large pool of them and then doing a selection uh, using the Gini index. So the similarity-based uh, component is uh, just the proximity forest I've already explained. The dictionary-based um, splitter uh, recodes the 
uh, time series uh, using what is called a dictionary-based technique. So essentially what it's doing is it's um, discretizing the uh, values within the series. And then it takes sub sequences of a particular length. Here we have a length three and it puts the interval, which have been called A, B, C, D, E here, uh, into a, uh, in this case, three character word. And then simply for each of those words, um, creates a histogram of its frequency. So it converts a time series looking like this into a histogram of how frequent different local patterns are. The BOSS dictionary-based um, classifier um, included in COAT acts in this way. Uh, what we do is we, uh, at each node, select a random dictionary transformation, uh, then select a reference histogram per class. So we again choose one of the series to be a reference, uh, to, to be an exemplar series and, and take its histogram. And then we use a histogram similarity measure. So we partition the distance again on proximity, but proximity to the reference histograms in this case. We use uh, um, random transformations, whereas uh, BOSS chooses the transformations to use using cross-validation. The interval splitter takes the idea that I presented uh, in my uh, ECG example at the very beginning of how different things may be relevant, uh, that sometimes local patterns are important. So what the interval-based splitter does is select a particular region within the time series and then take some simple summary statistics of what is happening within those regions. Uh, so uh, the, the, the four summary statistics uh, that are used in the um, version of this rise used in the original coat are the autocorrelation function, the partial autocorrelation function, autoregression and power spectrum. Uh, so we use those, and again, we um, uh, and and uh, let me I think we explain it here. So what we're going to do, uh, so in Rise, they very carefully select good intervals. What we're going to do is select random intervals, um, and we're going to take uh, random transforms so of the four transforms, randomly select one, then we'll simply use that for a classic decision tree attribute value split. <clears throat> when we add these two additional type of splitters, uh, TS Chief uh, was able to achieve the same level of uh, accuracy as Hivecoat. Uh, and here I'm showing a scatter diagram. So each of these little boxes is um, a, a, a represents one of the University of California Riverside benchmark tasks. We're plotting the accuracy of TS Chief against the accuracy of Hive Coat for each of these tasks. Above this line means TS Chief has the higher accuracy below the line means hive code has the higher accuracy. One of the nice things is that there are some tasks for it, which each is significantly more accurate than, than the other. And why is this nice? Because it shows that there's still a lot of room for developing more accurate time series classifiers. So TS Chief is performing at a comparable level to Hive Coat, uh, but it is vastly more scalable. So on our um, 
on our Earth observation uh, ta uh, task. Uh, we're able to scale up to um, 130,000 time series uh, and learn from that uh, in two days, whereas Hivecoat requires eight days to, to learn from just 1,500 uh, series. Okay, so moving on, we next go to our deep learning approach. So deep learning uh, has revolutionized many fields of uh, machine learning. Uh, and there's every reason to believe it might be good uh, in time series classification. But early attempts at performing deep learning in time series classification we're not achieving the level of performance of a hive coat. But we um, thought that this may be because we're not uh, extracting the correct information. And convolutions, which have been developed for use in um, image recognition tasks, uh, appear to be highly applicable to time series. So a convolution uh, is simply a little mask of values. You multiply the values within the mask uh, to a region of the image uh, and then plot that in order to highlight various aspects of the image. Here we're seeing the result of a um, edge detection convolution applied to this image. We can do the same trick with time series. If we take this simple um, filter, minus one, minus one, zero, one, one, and run that along a time series, then we get a resulting time series that represents the gradient of the original time series. So these filters can pick out many different aspects of a time series that may be relevant. The inception architecture was originally proposed uh, by Google for image recognition tasks. And its idea was to apply convolutions at multiple resolutions in order to capture different types of patterns. Uh, problem then is that um, right, so each application of a convolution results in a new image. So you need ways of, right, so, so if you apply many, many convolutions, you're exploding uh, the amount of information you have. So you need ways of bringing that back down. Uh, and the way uh, in which that's done is by what's called a bottleneck layer, which brings uh, the, the results back to a single image-like thing. Uh, so we applied this idea to time series instead of images. So you have an input time series. Uh, you then apply multiple convolutions at different resolutions, which then gets you uh, effectively a multi-dimensional time series. Uh, and then you um, uh, for uh, then do uh, this pull, pulling together uh, process, the bottleneck, uh, feed it through more layers and so on. And then you finally do global average pooling, which is a method of reducing the entire series to discrete values. Uh, so that's the details of uh, our architecture. Um, and we found that uh, this is a very effective technique, but it had relatively high variance. So we ended up um, doing an ensemble of five of these. There's high variance because uh, the process of training these um, uh, is not a um, convex optimization problem. Uh, so it's not possible to uh, find a global optima. So we end up in local optimas. Uh, and if we on ensemble multiple of these local optima, we get a very good overall result. 
To cut a long story short, we get uh, comparable accuracy to hive coat. Um, oops, back up. And again, uh, the, the time is much better than uh, hive coat. Uh, although it must be uh, said that uh, that is time on GPUs as opposed to time on CPUs. So perhaps the amount of power consumed in order to get the results uh, is slightly more comparable. So this now brings us to the final of the techniques I'm going to present, uh, Rocket. This is the PhD work of Angus Dempster. So what Rocket does is exploit the power of convolutional filters. It does that by generating a large number of them at random, 10,000 by default. But then instead of putting it through a deep learning framework, we simply feed the output of all of those convolutional filters into a simple linear classifier. So when we have many examples, we use log uh, logistic regression. When we have a small number of examples, we use ridge regression for two reasons. One, it has very strong regularization, which is important when you have few examples. And also uh, it's able to um, learn extremely fast for small sample size. So how does this work? We're going to create a random convolution uh, so that's going to be a series of values uh, like these. Uh, sorry, like these. So minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, two, two, two. And we're going to run that along the series. So multiply each of these points by the values in the convolution. Uh, that gives resulting values. And we simply sum those to get a single value. When we do that, we get a new series, which is the result of all of these convolutional operations. We can then do that at multiple dilations. So if we do it at a dilation of one, we get local series, uh, we get local effects. If we do it at a larger dilation, we get less local effects. If we do it at sufficiently large dilations, then we start to see global effects. To feed um, these, but so each time we apply a convolution, we get a new series. Uh, we can't feed a full series into a linear classifier, or we can't readily do that. So instead, we want to extract a summary statistic. The summary statistic that we've uh, managed to discover is what we call proportion of positive values. And that is simply what proportion of the values are positive or above zero. But we first apply a bias term which moves the values up or down. So with a high bias, um, the proportion of values above zero is going to be small. Uh, with a negative uh, bias, the proportion of values is going to be very high. And I think if we were to start over, we wouldn't call this proportion of positive values. We wouldn't call this bias. Instead, we'd be talking about proportion of values above a threshold. But I think the easiest way to think about this is we're going to choose a threshold term, and then we're going to work out how many uh, values in the convolved output are above that threshold. With Rocket, we do uh, many choices all at random. So 10,000 times, we're going to choose a length of the filter, 7, 9, or 11. We're going to choose the weights within that filter uh, from normal distribution centered on zero. Uh, we're going to choose a bias term between minus one and one. So you can think of that as being the um, uh, threshold that uh, we're going to measure the number of values above. 
which use a random dilation term such that the dilated filter is no longer than the series length. Uh, and we choose whether to do padding or not, which means uh, do we start with the left edge of the first application of the filter at the left edge of the series, or do we start with the center of the first application of the series uh, at the left edge? Uh, uh, first application of the convolution at the edge of the series, um, in which case we need to pad beyond the series with zeros. Uh, so it's a choice between whether we get a shorter output than the input or get the same length uh, output. And we randomly do that half the time. Then we're going to use two features, the proportion of positive values and simply the maximum value. So that was the first version. Uh, and then we uh, developed a, um, I think in almost all respects, superior version. So mini rocket stands for uh, minimally random. Uh, uh, and then the rocket stands for random. And I forget the rest of the details. So it's the minimally random version. So in mini rocket, uh, we just use length nine. Uh, we only use two weights, minus one and two. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about the weights in a second. Um, we choose the bias term from the convolutional output. So we actually apply the convolutions to some of the series in the uh, task and, and get actual output values instead of this arbitrary choice between minus one and one, which was sometimes uh, giving us always zero or always one as a response. Uh, and we um, have a fixed um, schedule of dilations. Uh, we still have um, uh, padding used sometimes and not used other times. We simply alternate between them and we only use proportion of positive values. So to do this in a pictorial form, we have our input series. We have a set of convolutions uh, of uh, kernels we're going to apply. We're applying them is the convolution. We get an output series. We then do pooling. Uh, so in the original rocket with max or PPV, that gives us features, which we then feed into a linear classifier. With mini rocket, we've got a set fixed of kernels instead of the random ones. Uh, they only have the two values, um, minus one and two. Uh, and then the convolutional process can be highly optimized because we know in advance exactly what we're going to be doing. And we have half as many features because we only use PPD. Um, So comparing PPV to max, PPV is almost always superior. Uh, and here uh, we're looking at how various versions of the original rocket scale as you increase the quantity of data. So we can see that it's highly scalable. Uh, so this is scalability with respect to Accuracy, so the more data we have going up to a million examples, the more accurate we are. Uh, this is comparing against TS Chief and Proximity Forest. Uh, so if we have fewer convolutions and hence are faster, we get slightly lesser accuracy than uh, TS Chief uh, or Proximity Forest, but with the full 10,000 Examples were more accurate, but were many orders of magnitude. So this is plotting time as we increase the training set size um, on a log scale. So we can see we're orders of magnitude more efficient than the previous scalable alternatives. Uh, here's showing a similar uh, results with respect to time series length. So it's significantly uh, more scalable with respect to uh, series length. Here's scalability of mini rocket versus rocket. Um, again, with respect to uh, training set size, 
uh, and so orders of magnitude more efficient. And here we have accuracy on the UCR repository. So the most recent versions of uh, Hivecoat are now more accurate than TS Chief, but not statistically significantly more often so than either Mini Rocket or Rocket. Uh, but Mini Rocket and Rocket are statistically significantly more accurate than most of the previous uh, uh, approaches. But Hivecoat requires more than two weeks, as does TS Chief, to classify the entire, to learn and classify the, uh, from the entire benchmark repository. Mini Rocket requires only eight minutes, whereas Rocket requires two hours. Inception time requires more than four days on GPUs, and the others all take uh, the best one requires 13 hours. So you can see we're more accurate than most of the alternatives and many orders of magnitude more, more efficient. Now, you should always be cautious when someone like me stands, or in this case, appears virtually in front of you and says how much better our approaches are than anybody else's. Uh, so I thought I'd give you somebody else's assessment. Um, Rocket wasn't designed for multivariate time series classification, but a trivial extension of it uh, applies it to, to that case. And, um, and uh, a paper, sorry, recently published by these people assessed Rocket as both the best rank ranked in terms of accuracy and by far the fastest uh, for multivariate time series classification. There's much more research to do in this area of uh, research. Uh, so we've started looking at additional summary statistics. There's no reason to believe positive uh, proportion of positive values or proportion of values above a threshold is in some way a magical way of extracting the most information out of these co convolutions. There's no reason to believe that these filters are the best possible set of filters to use. Uh, the rocket features aren't just suitable for time series classification. We've shown they can actually be used for predicting numeric outcomes as well as for classification and believe that they ought to be good for clustering and anomaly detection. Uh, and there's potential for doing this uh, general architecture with other types of data beyond time series. So I think I've run out of time. So fortunately, I've run out of talk also. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, ensemble techniques have revolutionized time series classification. Uh, TS Chief uh, combines the efficiencies of tree-based divide and conquer with uh, the advantages of stochastic selection uh, and exploits um, many decades of uh, specialized work in, in time series prediction. Inception time uh, is a very different approach, which brings uh, the power of deep learning and is currently the state of the art in deep learning applied to time series classification. And then Mini Rocket leapfrogs all of these approaches and provides state of the art accuracy with many, many orders of magnitude less computation. We believe in reproducible research and we also like people to use our stuff. So please rush out and download these systems and start using them. And this has been the work of many, many, many people. Uh, and these are key members of the team. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, was a great talk, actually. I learned something, definitely. <laughs> Um, so we, we can start officially the discussion session. If somebody in, from the audience has questions, please just pass the question. I think you will be heard. This microphone is good. I have a, an, an easy question, I think. So 
in the first one when you were doing the, the red um, wave and then the green wave, and you were decided then to choose them randomly, but then you you chose five to see which one was the best because if you if you yeah if you cho chose a red one for the left and a red one for the right, then it wouldn't have been a very good tree, right? So you you chose several and then you picked the one that seemed to work best, right? So uh, I would so so I perhaps didn't quite explain that in full right? detail. So we have a branch associated with each class and then we randomly select one exam oh, one wow. case from each class to be the example okay. of that class so we always are going to in this case have a red one and a green one all right all right see so yeah, in I, the I, first version of proximity forest we just made that random choice once and randomly chose a distance measure and parameterization and that was just it. Uh, with uh, the second version, we did that random choice five times. Right? So if there were um, uh, 10 examples of each class, and that means there'd be 100 possible pairs, and we would be choosing five of those 100 possible pairs. Uh, then there's 11 distance measures, uh, and each of them, or most of them, have 100 possible parameterizations. So that's 11,000 distance measures. So that would have been um, over a million possibilities for what the choice is, and we choose five of those at random and then right. select the best amongst those five. So my question was, in the later systems, did you use the same similar thing when you had to Choose something yes, so I skipped over that detail a little bit. Uh, with with um, with TS Chief, we kept five of these um, similarity based splitters, and then we had larger numbers of the other splitters for two reasons. Uh, the other splitters tended to be less powerful, so you needed to do more of them in order to give them a chance of beating the similarity-based ones. Uh, and also, they're much faster, so you can yeah. afford to do more. Yeah, so so you did continue with the thing of trying multiple things. And trying then... many, many stochastic possibilities and selecting the best of a pool. Yeah, because I would have thought if you just stochastically chose one thing, it would do much less well than if you chose a number of times and then tried to pick the one that seemed to be working. Uh, so my so my hypothesis is, right, because we continue until we have a pure tree. Okay. Um, and my hypothesis is that if you had enough trees, then just doing it at random is actually going to be superior because it's less biased. All right. But to, uh, if you're not going to have a million trees, which may be the number you need, uh, then, then uh, you're going to need to do something a bit cleverer to get the best possible accuracy within the limited number of trees. All right. That makes sense. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi. It's uh, Jacek Kowalski from Australian Unity. Uh -huh. uh, we collect data from IoT sensors, which we use for monitoring uh, rehabilitation at home for people who had oh. uh, knee or, or hip replacement operation. Yes. And uh, what we found is that uh, multi-layer LSTMs, so it's typically like two LSTM layers and, and one dense layer, and we classify into 20 classes, and they, they, they are doing a reasonably good job. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll, I'll be very keen to apply, uh, you know, some of the techniques that, that you guys um, have come up with. But have you looked at uh, LSTMs? Obviously, they are not yes, very so, scalable. So, um, at one stage, LSTMs were considered the, uh, the most accurate uh, deep learning approach. Uh, but, but the convolutional approaches uh, across the UCR repository, and I think we need to be a little bit cautious here because 
uh, there's always a worry with the uh, um, field of research like this, which is uh, which uses a single benchmark problem or set of problems um, to compare things that you may be uh, tuning performance too much just to that. But across the UCR repository, uh, convolutional approaches appear to be much more powerful than LSTMs. Actually, we, we tried both, and in our case, uh, obviously, you know, there is a lot of things that you can do with uh, convnets, but uh, you know, we tried a few, but uh, LSTM seemed to be doing uh, you know, a, a reasonable job, and it was really simple. Yes. Yeah, so one 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 of the one of the things is there are just so many things which may be relevant to different time series uh, analysis tasks that. Um, uh, it's really foolish to expect one to be best at everything. Look, if you are looking for data for your you know, PhD students or, or yep. students in general, I'm more than happy to, to give you some. So <laughs> if it's possible to uh, make it public, uh, then we would be delighted. Yes, to... yes because it is, it is all anonymized and you won't know, you know which um, uh, patient the, the data belongs to. So, yeah, I'm happy to. Oh, that's wonderful. If, if you would be uh, prepared to share that with us, then uh, we would be more than happy to uh, share the performance of our algorithms on it. Okay, so we have to catch up one day and... <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah. Okay, there's a question. Uh, I've got a question about rocket uh, and the... So you have uh, 10,000 trees uh, is the parameter uh, that was chosen. I saw in one of your graphs, you have one for a performance uh, metric for 10 and 100, 10,000. Uh, is 10,000 just the point at which you get like diminishing returns? Or why was 10,000 chosen? And have you, have you tried uh, a larger number as well? Um... So the real reason 10,000 was chosen, uh, where's the relevant graph? The real reason, oh, I haven't got it here. The real reason 10,000 was chosen was because it put on one of these um, plots rocket at the same level as, um, as hive coat, right? Whereas uh, smaller numbers didn't. So we chose the smallest number, which um, gave us, which put us to the right of uh, hive coat. So, so, so in some sense, it's uh, um, uh, a slightly sneaky uh, choice. I get that. Uh, just how much closer to the state of the art do you get with, um, say, a hundred thousand, or you tried? So it's, it's a real story of diminishing returns. Okay. Um, uh, so so um, we, we, we don't find any, any substantial uh, improvement with Rocket above around 10,000 uh, on most tasks. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where from task to task, it can vary, vary a bit. Oh, cheers. So uh, where from here would you, are, is your future work really focusing on rocket only or are you still considering proximity forest or uh, other approaches? Good question, good question. So um, uh, rocket is certainly um, uh, the key foundation for uh, just pure, black box classification tasks. Uh, and we are working on uh, numerous, numerous fronts there. Uh, but also uh, it's very important in some contexts to have uh, explainable systems or understandable models. Uh, and I think the, the most promising path towards that is the tree-based classifiers. So we're certainly keen to pursue the tree-based uh, classifiers from that perspective. Um, 
plus uh, um, um, there's been a lot of work on tuning hive coat, uh, and I think many things that they've done that uh, TS Chief could benefit from. Uh, so uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, have not abandoned uh, the tree-based approaches. Uh, at this stage, the deep learning uh, doesn't doesn't seem to have a strong place uh, because the extra million or so, or the many millions of extra parameters, just don't seem to be needed. Uh, in this respect, because you said that you, you tested this on the big repository of different data sets, did you did analysis maybe to see which of the filters or which of the splitters performed very well across the different data sets? If you kind of, if you can recommend, uh, not recommend, sorry, like did you do a, a more in-depth analysis seeing, okay, if I choose this splitter set early stage in the tree when I'm developing, then I get much better results, somehow understanding the the inside of the, the the workings of your algorithm in a way with respect to the different types of data sets you had yeah thank you it's a uh, a interesting area to explore and uh indeed we've got got one one student uh working on this um so i i, I wouldn't be too keen on um on working on trying to tune the choice of uh, splitters too much to the UCR repository, because uh, I don't think that the UCR repository reflects uh, the all of um, useful and interesting time series problems. Uh, but I think there is a lot of potential for tuning um, the splitters on a task by task basis. Uh, so I think it's um, entirely likely that uh, for some tasks, uh, say the similarity splitters are going to be uh, most important, whereas for others, the interval ones are. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at is uh, whether it's possible to learn while you're learning what the most useful splitters are uh, and exploit that in some way. Right, so you can consider each time you have a pool of candidates and do a genie evaluation to select the best one you can consider each of those as a, a potential chance for learning in some way you're learning that this type of split uh, looks more productive than these ones uh, so we're looking at how how you might learn from that and tune the pools of uh, available splitters as you proceed through the learning task when you said different tasks, did you mean, um, you know, uh, uh, air, you know, motor sensor versus IoT, or did you mean like classification versus amplitude versus? Because you've talked about yeah. both things, right? So, so, um, right. So, what I meant is that for uh, a particular application of classification. So it might be a different type of data. So it might be one type of sensor as opposed to another type of sensor, or it might be, as I showed with the uh, very early slide, uh, with the ECG uh, data, exactly the same data you might use for many different classification tasks. So is the heartbeat regular or irregular? Is it strong or weak? Uh, so, so that's so more what you meant by task. So that's what I meant by different tasks. And then okay, each okay. of those different tasks, different aspect of, aspects of the series may be relevant yep. to, to the task. Yep. That makes sense. Uh, is there any question in the audience? Is there any question in the chat? Because I see that's red. Here. Yeah, that's an answer. That's an answer. Okay. But mm -hmm. is there a question by that? I don't think they heard you, Jorg. No, you have to say that. <laughs> Any questions from our guests and Vaikata? Any questions here? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I have a quick question. Is uh, for your inception model and you define a one-dimensional convolution 
uh, kernel over the time series. And uh, I just wonder, have you tried to stack the time series together to form a two-dimensional matrix and then you perform two-dimensional convolution? And if uh, if we do so, and uh, uh, what is the, um, will there's and benefits uh, for the one-dimensional uh, convolution comparing to the two-dimensional case? Thank you. Uh, nice question, thank you. Um, so, um, there are a number of ways you might might consider this. So I think you might have been suggesting taking multiple time series and uh, stacking them. Uh, and I'm not sure what the task would be for which that was uh, suitable. But another another way in which you can interpret the, the question is what if you have a series that uh, actually has uh, multiple vari variables in it? Right, so uh, you might you might have multiple sensors on the one device, for example, um, and uh, so that's multivariate uh, time series classification. And the inception time architecture. Let's see if I can find where the diagram is. Is actually directly applicable to that. So I showed uh, the input as being a single dimensional. Uh, series, but you can see that's then fed into one of these inception layers. And each of those inception layers actually outputs multiple series, so results of different convolutions at different resolutions. Uh, so the input to this inception layer could equally be a multi-dimensional series. So, so uh, it actually, so our implementation actually accepts multi-dimensional um, series here, and if there was an application where it uh, made sense to um, have multiple series instead of a single series, you could also stack multiple series and feed them through. So, yes, indeed, that is a um, both rational thing to do and uh, relatively straightforward thing to do. Thank you. And I have a question, please. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, for different uh, time series in the uh, you are see, in the repository, basically the ranking uh, the rankings of different algorithms are um, different, and also uh, you, you mentioned that LSTM also does well on some uh, data sets, but does pretty bad on others. So is there any way of uh, like do do the ranking uh, do the rankings show any sort of patterns? Like, or like, does it seem to be completely random? Like, uh, or in other words, is there a way of guessing which uh, which algorithm would perform on a task before trying the algorithms on the task? Or uh, basically, I mean, uh, do the like, does the um, tasks have a certain um, sort of semantic meaning that would determine uh, which algorithm will work well on them? Uh, so very good question. And it would be a very, very desirable uh, tool mm -hmm. if somebody could develop a technique for predicting what type of, um, of uh, algorithm is going to be most applicable to a particular time series analysis task. Uh, but I fear that the uh, properties, right? So I'm confident there are properties of the task which determine which uh, approaches are best, but I fear that the relevant properties fall within the function, right? So the true function that maps the series onto the um, outputs, right? So if you knew what the true function was, then you'd be able to extract from that the pro um, properties which would enable you to determine what would be the best learner to approximate that function. But of course, if you knew the function, then you wouldn't need to approximate it. Uh, so, so the problem would be gone. So I don't think that it's um, uh, uh, going to be dominated by the properties of the underlying series. Um, uh, and I think the example I gave of all the different classification tasks you might have for ECGs uh, shows that fairly clearly. Um, okay, thank you. So we can do no better than random guess. 
Uh, well, what, what is typically done is a process like lead one out cross-validation. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, um, you, you, you try different techniques and see which ones uh, perform better in practice. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, sorry, uh, just one, one follow-up question, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, so um, does transfer learning apply to this problem? Like, I mean, if we have presumably two time series problems that are quite similar, then do we benefit from transferring from one time series to another one? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question because it's uh, an area that uh, I'm extremely interested in. Uh, so, um, and and uh, and we've done some work on. So, um, the the motivating application for much of our work is uh, the Earth observation uh, and um, different regions of the Earth um, differ very greatly in how uh, the way they appear from space relates to the the thing that we're interested in being able to to determine um, so for example if you're wanting to determine uh, what crop somebody's growing uh, the varieties of wheat that are grown in different parts of the earth are actually different to each other uh, so they're going to appear different from space. The agricultural uh, practices are different. The seasons are different. So the growing cycles are different. Uh, so um, you can't just learn a model in one region and then apply it to the entire globe. And this is problematic because uh, the, the labelled data we have from which we can learn models um, is quite rich in the developed world and very sparse in the developing world. Uh, so much of the, the world's um, land area, it's very hard to get the labelled data for, uh, but you can't just learn the models um, in one region and uh, directly apply them uh, elsewhere. So we are studying... Um, transfer learning uh, and we've shown, for example, that even uh, within France, where a lot of our labelled data comes from, uh, a land use map trained in central France doesn't transfer very well to the south east, um, where the climate is quite different. Well, thank you. Thank you. So if there are no, no questions, okay, there are no questions from the audience and from the online audience, then I will thank the speaker, Jeff, again. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, and I hope that uh, sometime in the not too distant future, I'm able to actually uh, come and speak to you all in person rather than doing it virtually as we have today. But thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present our work today. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to close this session. Thank you all for coming. And we'll see you probably on our next May session. We'll have a, no, sorry, that will be June session, yeah? And in yeah. June, we'll have a guest from Netherlands. Do you remember our speaker? Hey, we forgot Jan. Yeah, yeah okay. So we'll, we'll send an announcement. So have a good evening or good afternoon, <laughs> wherever you are at the globe. So bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.